This is my second Sunday preaching, and I come up weeping both times. I don't know. Wow, God is so good. Amen? Amen. Amen. So for those of you who are new here this morning, I just want to welcome you. I, our prayer and our hope is that you would experience welcome, that you would experience love, that you would feel that this morning. And if you are new, you're not alone. I am also new. And so I've just started here at uh, Wilmot Center Church as the pastor of Engage Ministries. So my role is to be out there in the community to tell people that Jesus loves them and that there is life transformation in his name because Wilmot Township needs Jesus. Amen. 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 So um, just want to welcome you. Just want to update you on some of the things that have been going on. I haven't, you haven't seen my face in a, in a little while. Um, so in the month of January, there was a few Sundays that I was away and uh, I was ministering at Evangel uh, Community Church in Kitchener um, on one of the Sundays in January. And uh, the other Sunday I was in Calgary. So I've got, I have the honor of serving on the, uh, <clears throat> the denomination's uh, national prayer team. And so there's pastors from different parts of Canada that meet. We meet online and we pray together for our denomination. We are praying for revival Amen. We want to see revival. We want to see God move in an unprecedented way in our denomination, in all of our churches, all across this nation. Um, we want to see Jesus being praised um, big time. And so we're, we pray uh, regularly online, but we also get together once or twice a year to pray face to face. And so this year, uh, that meeting, the first of our face to face meetings was in Calgary. So it's just an honor uh, to be able to serve our denomination that way. Uh, last Sunday, I spoke at Eastridge Church in Stouffville, and I spoke on the topic of healing and the kingdom of God. Um, one of my passions uh, when I'm preaching on the Great Commission or preaching on preaching the gospel, I talk about healing because a lot of times you see in the New Testament when Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, he healed the sick. It's not two separate things. It's actually the same thing, same, two sides of the same coin. And so if you want to take a look at that message, it's on Eastridge Church's uh, website, and so it's there as well. And this past week, I was in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Uh, that wasn't the Texan accent, sorry. I don't, know. I don't know how to do it. It's really hard. Sometimes I need a translator to translate Texan English to English. But anyways, I was in Dallas for uh, <clears throat> an E3 uh, Partners boot camp, kind of a, a training seminar for new missionaries. And so I was, uh, I was in Dallas where the weather was not that warm, actually. I was pretty upset, actually, because I was hoping for, like, you know, plus 20 degree weather, and it was, like, 5 degrees. I was like, what? What's going on here, man? So, anyways, it wasn't the greatest, but, you know, it was good. Lots of good food. Um, so this is Family Day weekend. Happy Family Day, everybody. Um, you know, we've been celebrating Family Day in Ontario since 2008. That's when it was first established. And I know we, as a family, have done a lot on Family Day. It's, it's definitely something to look forward to because, you know, winter's so long, you know. And, you know, the first part of winter, it's like, okay, Christmas is coming, so you can, no problem. You know, we could deal with the cold weather. Christmas, I mean, Christmas, it, it trumps cold weather, right? So then you go through Christmas, and that beauty of Christmas, it only lasts like a week after Christmas. So you get to January 2nd, you're like, oh man, there's like a whole nother long road of winter ahead. Well, at least there's family day, you know, right in the middle of that. So that's where we are. And, you know, there's just a few more weeks until spring. So happy family day. So in light of this weekend being family day, we are uh, going to be pushing the pause button on the series in Nahum. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, just speaking a sermon on the topic of family. But first, before I jump into this uh, sermon, I just want to say two things. Number one, that this is not a sermon that will give parents a to-do list of things, okay, or how to be a better parent. That's not what this sermon is about. It's not about doing. It's more about being, being rooted and grounded. And really, the, 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 one of the songs that we sang this morning, Build My Life, that actually summarizes this message totally. And so um, this is not going to be 
a, t- a sermon on doing things. Because I mean, I, I, I'll be the first to admit it. I'm not an expert at parenting. I fail. I fail at times. And there's times where I look at myself, I'm like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I get so upset? Why did I? And it all comes back to this idea of being rooted. Whenever I get triggered or do something that I will regret, it comes back to this foundational thing. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And the second thing I want to say is this. Although this is a message about families, um, in particular parents, it's not just for families. It's not just for parents. It's for anyone in a discipling relationship of some kind with another person. Whether you are a small group leader, whether you are a mentor to somebody, maybe you are a father figure or a mother figure, this is for you. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to be looking at a passage today in the Old Testament. This is a passage that I read every time we did a child dedication. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse uh, 4 to 9. So if you have your Bibles, you can open it to that. Uh, It's also up on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading from verse 4. So this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so the title for my message this morning is Raising Disciples. Will you pray, pray with me one more time before we begin? So Father, thank you. Your word, your word is true. Your word is our guide, our hope, and our light. Light our path today. I speak to every single person here, whether they are a parent, whether they are a mentor, whether they are a mentee, whether they are in a discipling relationship of some kind. God, speak to us. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been reading this book. It's called Raising Disciples by uh, an author by the name of Natalie Frisk. And uh, it's a good book. Now, I'm not a big reader, actually. Um, Not really a big reader. But right now, our E3 missionaries are challenging each other to read 15 books and the whole Bible this year. And so I'm like, wow, 15 books? That's more than one a month, man. And so, but, you know, I haven't finished one yet. um, But I've got like five on the go. And that's kind of what I do. I've got like five books on the go. I'll read a little bit, but I almost won't finish any of them. You know, that's just how I read. I typically, I go in there, I take what I need, and I'm gone. Like, that's kind of how I read. Uh, But then once in a while... I'll pick up a book and I can't put it down. There are books like that, aren't there? And I, I, I think this might be one of those books, Raising Disciples by Natalie Frisk. It's a really good one. In fact, the very first few pages of this book really captured my attention and inspired me for this message. And so the author uses Deuteronomy chapter 6, the passage we just read, to lay the foundation. In fact, she says that all parents, all families should have this readily available to them, this passage, because there's so much in here in uh, in terms of uh, wisdom for how we raise disciples. And so the passage starts like this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, this phrase is actually a very important phrase in the Jewish faith. It's called the Shema. Everyone say Shema. Okay. The Shema is a prayer. It's a prayer that the Jewish people pray regularly in the morning and in the evening. They repeat it because it's a declaration. Some Jewish circles say this is the most important prayer in all of their prayers. 
Why? Because it's declaring who God is. God, you are one. There's no one else besides you. You are holy. You are set apart. In fact, that phrase, that idea, it's repeated again and again throughout the scriptures, right? God, there's no one like you. No one besides you. In fact, the Lord's prayer even starts like that in the New Testament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or holy is your name. That means you're set apart. There's no one like you. The name above all other names. So this is a very important prayer called the Shema. Um, And the Jewish people, they repeat it again and again and again. So what happens when you repeat something? What happens? You memorize it. It becomes a part of you. It gets engraved in your spirit. It's there in your soul when you repeat something again and again and again. My daughter, Junia, she loves singing. And she loves the song, Ba Ba Black Sheep. Like, really loves that song. And so she'll ask me, she'll be like, Appa. Appa means daddy in Korean, by the way. So for those of you who watch Kim's Convenience, okay? Main character, Appa, that's daddy, dad, okay? That's not his name, that's, that's daddy. So she'll come up to me, she'll be like, Appa, Baba Blackie, <clears throat> Baba Blackie, which means, can you sing Baba Black Sheep? And I'll be like, okay. Baba Black Sheep, have you any will? Right? And so I'll sing the song. She'll be like, again, again. And I'll sing it again. I'll be like, man, I've got to sing a Christian, like a, a Jesus song at least, you know, because I want to get that engraved in her heart. So then I'll switch gears. I'll be like, Jesus loves you, this I know. And she'll be like, no, Baba Blackie. I'm like, oh, man. This is my life. You know? Every day of my life, this is what I'm doing, singing Baba Black Sheep. It's her favorite song. Her second favorite song is Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Now, did you know that Ba Ba Black Sheep and Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star is the same song? It's like the same melody. Did you know that? I had no idea until my daughter wanted me to sing it one after the other. I had no idea. Ba Ba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Oh, I think it was the same person that wrote both songs. It was like you know what, I'm going to do one about stars, and I'm going to use the tune for Black, Baba Black Sheep. That's what they did, okay? She, and she wants me to repeat it again and again. And, but you know what, here's the thing, that's how she learns. That's how kids learn. That's how we all learn. It's the same with books. My daughter will be like, Peppa Pig, can you read Peppa Pig? Okay, I'll read it again, again. All our kids are like that. Dora, Fancy Nancy, Transformers, Peppa Pig, you know. We repeat things because that's how they learn. And that's why the Jewish people prayed this prayer again and again, day and night, night and day. In fact, it says this in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently, teach these words diligently to your children. And they shall walk and talk to them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. In other words, every day, every moment of the day, when you get up, when you sit down for a meal, when you're going for a walk, when you're going for a drive, before you go to bed at night, teach them these words. Why? Because repetition is key to making something stick. Verse 8 says this, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, let it be everywhere you go. Let it be everywhere you go. On your hand, on your forehead. In fact, the Jewish people took this quite literally. And they have these things called the tefillin or the phylacteries. There's a picture. Um, <clears throat> they take this quite literally, those little boxes. They have parchment paper inside with Deuteronomy 6 written on it also passages from Exodus, and they recite it again and again, right? They have it on their forehead. They have it around their hand, right? It's very important. They took it quite serious for teaching children the way they should go. 
So let's dive into this. Let's look at the meat of this prayer, okay? In verse uh, 4, again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Maybe you've read through the New Testament as well, and you saw this somewhere, repeated. It's almost as if God's saying, you got to know this. I'm repeating it. It's very important. Right? It's mentioned, Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 22, 37 to 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. We need to teach our kids, our disciples that we're raising. We're raising disciples to love God. To love them, we need to teach them day and night, night and day. That's the foundation to raising up disciples. But man, if you're like me, and I'm being honest here, this sounds like another thing, another source of failure to me. Another thing I could possibly fail at doing. Because parents, I'm sure that we've all, we all experience this at some point in our lives. We feel guilt when it comes to our raising our kids, especially when things happen or we do the comparison game. Oh, my kid doesn't play instruments. I'm a bad father. Oh, my kid just can't score a goal in soccer. I should have practiced more with them. Oh, oh my kids, they're just so rude. Why are they being so rude? I'm a terrible father. Guilt. How many of I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you feel that sometimes, right? And so this might be another thing that will test my performance-based thinking. Is this another thing that I'm going to fail at doing? But can I suggest something to you this morning that this is, this was never supposed to be about performance or doing. This is more about being birthed out of an experience of who God is, that he is one, that there's no one like him, that he's worthy of all our praise. And you want to know something amazing about our God? He commands us to love him, not out of duty, not out of religious activity, but do all these things, I prove my love for God. No, 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 that's not it. He's calling us to direct our affections towards him. Why? Because when we do that, we will discover love. Actually what love is, because God is love. First John 4, 7 and 8, beloved, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. All of our loving flows from our understanding of God and who he is. Because God is love. He trumps all other things, all other pleasures, all other affections. God, we discover, when we discover love in God, it changes everything. Changes the way we do everything. Let's think about this for a second, okay? What are you passionate about? Let me ask you that question. What are you passionate about? Is it hard to talk about what you're passionate about? No. It's so easy. It just flows. I'm passionate about food. <laughs> I love food. I love making food. I love eating food. I love all kinds of food. When I was in Dallas, I was trying to connect with my Texans. Hey, did you know that Tex-Mex is Texas Mexican? I had no idea. I didn't know. I, did, I thought it was something called Tex-Mex. I, I, I didn't know it was Texas-style Mexican. That's a thing. I didn't know that. Anyone else not know that? Is this your first time? I'm blowing your mind. Thank you. If anyone's watching from Dallas, see? Okay. <clears throat> I had no idea. No idea. 
there's a Texas style Mexican, and it's good. It's really good, very cheesy, like che spicy and lots of cheese. Yeah, so, mm, so good. So, anyways, we ate at a Texas Mexican restaurant. We also ate at, I guess you can call it a American style restaurant. You're wondering, what's American style food? Fried food, okay? Fried. And uh, I, I ordered something called the chicken fried steak. Chicken fried steak. I thought chicken fried steak was chicken. Isn't that funny? Why would you call it chicken then? There's no chicken in it. It's called chicken fried steak. I thought it was a piece of chicken deep fried. It's not. It's beef. There's no chicken in it. And I asked the people that I was with, the other missionaries, I was like, so what, what's the deal with that? Like, why is it called chicken fried steak? Oh, because we fry it the way we fry chicken. We fry steak the way we fry chicken. So it's called chicken fried steak. And I'm like, that's the weirdest thing. But I'm going to order it anyway. And you know what? It was awesome. Oh, man, it was so good. It's like the best of both worlds, steak and fried chicken in one. Americans, man, wow, they know how to make food. They really know how to make food. As you can see, I'm passionate about food. Allie and I, we also love thrift, thrift store shopping. Love it. It's like treasure hunting. You know, when you look through and you're like, oh. Look at that jacket. It's got its tags and everything. What? $12? Boom! Score! It's treasure hunting. It's awesome. And so we teach our kids about thrift store shopping. And they love it too. Look what I found! Right? We're teaching our kids what we're passionate about. Passion is transferable. Passion drives us. And passion can be trans, it can be taken to the next generation, passed on to the next generation. And God wants you to be passionate about him so that in turn, you can pass that on to the next generation. Passion for him, passion for his love. And so, okay, okay, you might be thinking, James, that's great, bro, but... What do I need to do to have passion for God? And how do I pass that on to my kids? Do I need to read the Bible more? Do I need to pray more? What do I need to do? I'm so glad you asked that question, man. That's such a good question. Thank you for asking that question. Very good question. Those are good things, definitely. But those things are not the starting point. That's not where we start. When we have the proper foundation, all those flow out of it. A few years ago, I was um, at a place where, um, just in ministry, where in, in ministry there's, there's days, there's weeks sometimes where everything kind of falls on one day. <laughs> everything just happens all at once. And I was going through one of those weeks um, in ministry where meetings, deadlines, you know, pastoral care meetings, and a sermon. So everything just piled in one week. And I was like, how am I going to do all this? And uh, it was just really neat. Just in the midst of that, my old pastor from back home in Mississauga, he messaged me on Facebook. He, he now moved to, um, I think it's uh, Seattle. He, he's in Seattle now, uh, pastoring a church. He planted a church out there. And uh, he was looking on Facebook, and he saw my profile and my um, job title, which was lead pastor at the time. And he's like, what? James, lead pastor? Because I was the last person in his church that he would have ever thought would ever become a pastor. I mean, I was one of those kids that he probably, you know, most pastors would probably pray for and be like, oh, God. Oh, God, somehow I'll get that guy. I was that for him. And so he messaged me. He's like, I, how in the world did this happen, James? I'm coming to um, Toronto. I want to meet with you. Let's chat. I need to know your story. Because he's been praying for me. 
And I was one of those miracle stories. Like, there's no way. Could, is it possible that God could reach this guy? Well, yeah, absolutely. And so we met at a coffee shop uh, in Cambridge. And I just asked him a simple question. I was like, Pastor Juan, you know, how do you, how do you balance family life and ministry? Like, I've got all this stuff that I got to do. And he was like, all right, I'm going to show you something. And he, wrote, and he drew it on a napkin, and it's changed my life. It's something that I refer back to again and again. I repeat it again and again, and it grounds me. It, keeps, it makes me stand on that firm foundation in, in Christ. You know, some of the, like the songs that we're singing this morning, right? Our foundation is in Christ. It brings me back to that, and I want to share that with you. This is applicable to parents. This is applicable, applicable to anyone in a discipling relationship because we need to pass this on. We need to know it, receive it, and give it away, all right? And so this next slide, um, I call it the Asia wheel. All good things come from Asia, <laughs> except except the coronavirus. But anyways, <clears throat> um, so starting in the top corner where it says achievement, that's A, S, I, A. So the first A, achievement, okay? Right now we are potty training Junia. Man, I just, I wish we can get through this stage, you know? Like, God, why can't they come already knowing what to do? Like, why? <laughs> we have to do this again? Fourth time? It's so hard. But when our daughter sits on the potty and goes pee, we're like, yes, you did it. And she's like, what, what, what? And she's so happy, so happy. She achieves something. This is awesome. And so then the next time she does it again because she wants to hear, yay, you did it. And she'll be like, yay, potty, potty, yay. She achieved something. When you achieve something, in that moment, you feel significant, don't you? There's like, wow, I achieved this. Think about the things that you achieved. Last summer, we were playing slow pitch. Anyone play slow pitch here? Softball? Not that many, okay. All right. Anyways, I was playing on a team. We were down maybe a couple points, a couple, couple runs. It was the bottom of the ninth, uh, bases loaded. I came up to bat. You know where this is going. <laughs> yes. Walk off grand slam. The greatest feeling ever, man. Oh, man. We won. I was at the victory trot around the bases, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I felt so significant in that moment. Man, it felt so awesome. And then it began to kind of form this identity in me. I'm Mr. Slow Pitch, man. This is who I am. I'm the home run man. This is who I am, you know. This is me. And then when I run around first, run around to second, run around to third, and I come back home, I've got all my teammates waiting right there. Yeah, you know, high five. And right there, I feel acceptance. I am accepted by my team, and it feels great. Now I'm caught in this loop. I need to achieve things in order to feel significant, in order to be good with who I am, and in order to be accepted by others, by people, by every, anyone, by God. I need to do things in order to feel significant, in order to have a sense of who I am as a person. Home run, man. Next time I go up to bat, strike out. Oh, I feel like I died. Because a part of my identity just died there. This is the performance-based thinking. And the enemy wants you to stay in this soundtrack in your head again and again and again. 
And he does it through fear. Fear of disapproval. Fear of not being accepted. And so then you're, you're like a hamster on a wheel. I got to do things. I got to do things. I got to do things. I got to keep doing things. I fail. Oh, I feel like I died, but I got to keep going. I got to keep going. I got to tell my kids to keep doing and doing. You'll never get there. But thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. He flipped the script for us. So the next slide. In Christ Jesus, we are accepted. John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who received him, all who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Because of what Jesus has done. I am accepted. There's nothing that I could do to purchase that. He did it. Titus chapter 3 verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Not according to works done by us in righteousness. But according to his own mercy. It's because of what he has done. We are accepted. And now my identity is in Christ. I am a child of God. We sing about this. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's who I am. And because I'm a child of God, I am significant. We are called to be the light of the world. The salt of the earth. We can't do that. On our own strength. It's not possible. It's mission impossible. It's only possible. Because of what he has done. We are salt and we are light. Because of Jesus Christ living in us. And because we have Jesus Christ living in us. I can do all things. Through Christ. Who gives me strength. He flipped the script. It's going in the other direction now. And he keeps us on that direction through love. If you have to take a picture of this, take a picture. If you have to write it down, write it down. Remember it. Memorize it. Keep thinking upon it so that it becomes a part of who you are. It becomes engraved in your soul. And then everything you do, whether in parenting, whether in ministry, whether with any evangelism, anything that you're doing, it flows from this place. Grounded, rooted, and grounded in God's love for you. And when you discover that love, Here's the beautiful thing. 1 John chapter 4, 19 says this. We love because he first loved us. When you discover that love, oh man, the passion that rises in you, you can't help but tell the world. You can't help it. It's the nature of good news. Think about why it's called good news. When the raptors won, Crazy how the Raptors won the NBA championship. We can get so thrilled and excited that we have to tell people, did you see the game? Did you watch the Raptors? Did you see? And then, you know, one of the games earlier, I'm not a huge, like, I don't, I'm not a huge sports fan, but I had to watch this because my brother is a huge Raptors fan. But I, well, I can't remember which game. It wasn't the finals. It was one of them when Kawhi Leonard threw that, that one shot, and it was like, it bounced like four times. Oh, my goodness. I'm... We're telling people about that. It's so easy, isn't it? Let's be rooted and grounded in the love that God has for us. And we will sing and we will shout from the rooftops, rooftops who God is. 
That's where raising disciples starts from, from that place. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come, come forward. And I want to invite us this morning. Maybe you are here. And you need a fresh encounter of God's love for you. You need that script to be flipped. He needs to set the soundtrack of your mind to this, to, to who, he, who he is and who you are in him. I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to do that today. And so the altar ministry team is going to be here as well. If you need prayer, I don't want anybody to go home without a deeper revelation of God's love for you. Because all discipling relationships start from here. Let's get it. Let's receive it. Let's be transformed by it. And raise up the next generation in God's love. Amen? So I'm just going to read one last thing before we uh, worship again. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.